attention for a minute. Uh, we're very pleased and honored to have Dr. Skull with us tonight. He's a very unique individual. He's unique in the sense that he is born and raised in Denmark, and he was a young man when the German occupied Denmark in 1940. And he very early joined the underground movement, which he probably will tell more about tonight. He uh, laid on, uh, went to school and became an engineer, and came to America, where he first had his own company, and then later on uh, he became an educator. And he wrote a book about his experience during the war, which is well worth reading, and you probably will after you have heard him speaking. So we are very honored and happy to have you here tonight to give us your viewpoint of the Danish occupation and the Danish underground movement. Thank you, Dr. Skow. Thank you very much. Well, <clears throat> I see we have a few in here who can remember World War II. Not very many, though. <clears throat> For those of you who can't, which is most of you good people, let me just uh, recall that it started on the 1st of September, 1939, almost 60 years ago. Time really does fly. It started when Hitler sent three tank, tank armies crushing across the uh, Polish frontier and surging toward Warsaw. That campaign didn't last very long, just three weeks. Just long enough for the world press to coin a new word. Blitzkrieg, lightning warfare. In the aftermath of the opening, and that was the opening of World War II, in the aftermath, nothing much happened. In the fall, things were quiet on the main fronts. Then, in the spring of 1940, in April, uh, Hitler took the initiative, and German armies struck north and occupied Denmark and Norway. Denmark gave up, the Danes gave up their uh, easily accessible country after a couple of hours of token resistance and not very glorious chapter in Danish history. The Norwegians did somewhat better. They fought a delaying action of along their mountainous and uh, easily defensible coast. Then they evacuated their government and their royal family to Britain, where they set up an exile government. Things quieted down. And then about a month later, Hitler struck again, this time in the west, and uh, in a few weeks, he gained the absolute victory over France that had eluded Germany, Kaiser, the Kaiser's Reich, <clears throat> in four years of bloody carnage in World War I. So, by the late summer 1940, German armies stood astride the European continent. From the Soviet border to the Atlantic seaboard, German armies ruled. All of Europe was either occupied or what you might call friendly neutral. If these people, and when the war rolled through Europe, the short period it did, uh, a few people were discommoded and uprooted. Notably, of course, uh, POWs, uh, conscripted laborers, gypsies, Jews, and a few other minority groups. But the great majority of citizens either stayed put or very quickly returned to their homes. If this majority, and that was tens of millions of Europeans, could have been kept productively working, so they would need only a few Germans to monitor and uh, administer them, it would leave German manpower free for the main show which was yet to come and that was Hitler's uh, 
acquisition of Lebensraum, of living space in the East, in the Soviet Union. Uh, on the whole, the Germans succeeded. They did keep the occupied countries and Europe at large productively working. It certainly prolonged the war considerably beyond what it would have been had Germany been confined to its own resources. But in time, resistance to the occupying powers, a power appeared in many places and became a nuisance in several ways. It was started by a few individuals who were just naturally hell-bent on not accepting Nazi overlordship, and in time, resistance spread. That process is intriguing to look back on for several reasons. First, it shows how people reared in a democratic tradition are not easily pressured into accepting a totalitarian regimentation as a permanent living style. The process also gives you a broad indication of what was in store for the rest of the world, certainly for the rest of the Western world, in case of a Nazi victory. That prospect was not a happy one. And Denmark was in some ways the most instructive example of Nazi ineptitude when it came to ruling subject people. I was 19 when the war broke out. 19 is the optimum age for a soldier. It is also, as it happens, the optimum age for a saboteur or freedom fighter. Immediately when the Germans arrived, I decided to resist. I took down my first German on a dark street in Copenhagen one night, conveniently uh, blacked out by German decree. But that early in the occupation, I was strictly an oddball Almost nobody thought of resisting. Such behavior was not in the Danish national persona. It was not in our cultural makeup. In Denmark, as elsewhere in Western Europe, it took a while before it became evident that benevolent rule was not really within the Nazi capability. In contrast, this was immediately apparent in the East. Hitler's policy toward Russia, which he very candidly articulated uh, in, the, in July 1941, was uh, to decimate the Russian population and in turn to exterminate the Russian population and to do so by simple starvation. Starvation was something the German went in for a lot during the war. It is the cheapest method of killing by far. Uh, but since starvation was too slow for the Nazis' ambition to liquidate certain categories quickly, uh, extermination squads were sent in following close on the Nazi armies as they uh, went in into the Soviet area. Um, and uh, these extermination squads, Einsatzgruppen, uh, they're called, were dispatched to round up and massacre party officials, uh, Red Army political officers, Jews, inmates of uh, uh, mental institutions, in many cases uh, patients in hospitals that were being requisitioned. Uh, and in general, anyone looking disagreeable. Each, each Einsatzgruppe was relatively small, five to eight hundred men, but they very quickly caught a bloody trail for all to see. The largest single operation was in Kiev, where 33,000 people were massacred in only two days. Another high point was reached in Pinsk, where 16,000 were killed in one day. Uh, these were men, women, and children of all ages, people not prepared to resist, and of course, in any event, no match for police troops or military troops. It was done by hand, it was hand work, it was not by shooting. It was done with axes, with police dogs, and with hand grenades. Another shortcut to large-scale murder, murder was revealed when I interrogated Wehrmacht personnel after the German surrender. They explained to me in detail 
how they had herded, herded Russian POWs by the tens of thousands into so-called cages. A cage is just a plot of ground that is uh, fenced very primitively. In some cases, not even fenced, just marked off by stakes driven into the ground. The prisoners are herded into this enclosure and uh, deprived of their caps and their warm coats and left. And in a matter of surprisingly short time, uh, exposure and starvation uh, does the work of killing. These atrocities were committed in full public view without any attempt of concealment, not that it would have been possible anyway. Uh, but more important, the SS wanted this to be seen and to be known. Uh, it wanted it as public knowledge to instill fear. To that uh, end, they also introduced public hangings, something uh, that, of course, had not been seen in Europe since the Middle Ages. So, in the East, it was immediately apparent to the population itself that um, the German occupation was a threat to every person living there. And uh, the choice was quite simple between, it was a choice between fighting back or being exterminated. And fortunately for you and me, the Russians decided to fight back. Not so in Western Europe. There the situation developed quite differently. First of all, we in Western Europe had no inkling of the mayhem going on in Russia. Uh, and the German occupation forces in the West were, for the most part, well behaved, correct, even affable. Working against the Germans was the fact that in the role of overlords, they really were so damn insufferable. Um, first off, the most galling was censorship. Uh, to people who are used to free access to news, there's something way beyond simple annoyance in being muzzled with censorship. It was almost immediately looked upon as an insult to one's intelligence, which of course it is. Um, in an underground press, therefore, that is printing distribution of illegal news sheets became the start of resistance. The pent up demand for real news about what goes on, not just in the world at large, but in your own town, caused the phenomenon of the illegal press to mushroom overnight. Then some small and quite harmless demonstrations came about. In Aarhus, in Jodland, uh, a dozen junior high school students formed a little club. They called it the Churchill Club. And uh, they put their mothers to work knitting little round caps in the Royal Air Force insignia, you know, concentric circles, red, white, and blue. And for some reason, you know how things like that spread in certain age groups. Uh, it just swept the country, and before you knew it, mothers all over Denmark were sitting knitting little Royal Air Force insignia caps. You would think that the Germans would have the wisdom to ignore some junior high kids wearing little caps, but no. Bring on the Gestapo, which they did. Then the Germans wanted to collect Danish bronze coins. The one euro, two euro, and five euro pieces were bronze at the time. They don't exist anymore, of course, in that denomination. I think the smallest is a 25 euro piece nowadays. Anyway, these were bronze coins, and the Germans wanted them for the armament industry. So they collected or started to collect them through the banks, just withdrawing them. Well, overnight, these coins disappeared from circulation. And for a while in Denmark, it was real hard to get change when you bought something in a store. Then, of course, these cheap uh, substitute coins, uh, scrap, uh, zinc, and aluminum, and that sort of thing came into, into use. Then um, people started sporting and uh, uh, a little uh, lapel pin uh, commemorating the king's birthday. Then 
by untraceable common consent, that became a mark of resistance, of opposition, I should say, not, not resistance. Then, in restaurants, in uh, bars, in, at the opera, at the theater, people started to pull away from Germans in the audience. Before you knew it, there were two Germans sitting over here, there were three sitting over there, and there were kind of little islands in the audience, nobody sitting next to them. The government in the papers exhorted us, don't do that, the Germans don't like it. Well, you can imagine the effect of that. Now everybody knew it, nobody wanted to sit next to a German for anything. Uh, Tangible, tangible position to the Germans then grew imperceptibly at first. But in 1943, after the German debacle at Stalingrad, where it was shown for the first time that German armies can be beaten on the ground, and the Germans did it, uh, after that it began to gain a little bit of momentum. And, uh, once certain parts of society get involved, exciting things could happen. The police, for example, which issued ID cards, ID cards had to be carried by everybody after the uh, uh, Germans came, everybody over 17. Uh, the police, of course, was capable of producing perfect forgeries of ID cards. Uh, because they weren't really forgeries. They were new identities created out of empty air, to be sure, but they were really new identities. Then postal employees could intercept and destroy mail to the Gestapo or the SD, the Sicherheitsdienst, the German security police. Uh, that took place in Denmark. It took, took place even more in France, where uh, the Germans employed 12,000 informers in Paris alone, and these each week had to report to the SD. If that kind of reporting, that kind of information uh, is withheld for a period of time, even a few days, it very rapidly loses value. Uh, underground news sheets could sometime be distributed by just including it with the morning newspaper. The newspaper didn't have much in it, but the news sheet did. Um, university labs began to exp uh, experiment with things they hadn't tried before, making explosives. Actually, explosives are quite easy to make, as you probably know. Uh, what isn't so easy to make are good timing devices, detonators. Um, one lab in Copenhagen came up with a, a nice way to uh, neutralize Gestapo's sniffing dogs. And uh, the, you know, in the last year, I have twice come through uh, the Kennedy Airport from overseas. And each time, I have noticed when we stand in line to have our passport checked and stamped as we enter the country, uh, a customs officer kind of walks up along the line of these waiting passengers and he has a black Labrador with him and uh, the Labrador just wags her tail and walks up along the row and uh, suddenly she sits down next to somebody standing in line. And the customs officer said, excuse me, would you come into the office for a moment? And uh, the three of them, customs officer, the passenger in the black lab then with her tail whacking go into the office and uh, they just caught somebody trying to smuggle drugs. I think you should know this because I think it's encouraging that the people, these creeps who try to smuggle drugs are not smart enough to outweigh, to outwit a black Labrador. <laughs> now my advice to my students is always if you can't out with a dog. Don't go into the smuggling business. The, I am not going to tell you how to do it because you wouldn't be interested, but it, uh, it's, as you can imagine, not very difficult to, to neutralize a dog.
they came up with that. Uh, all these activities were spurred by the Germans' propensity for violence. Uh, they showed themselves inhumane in European societies that had long traditions of respect for the individual. As a matter of fact, when the Germans rounded up Jews in Paris, they sequestered them for a couple of days in the Villodrome d'Hiver, the uh, uh, indoors uh, bicycling rank in, rank in Paris. Uh, that particular little incident upset Parisian opinion more than even the taking and shooting of hostages. Um, so confronting what began as simple non-cooperation, the German occupation governments very early fell back on outright terror. Punishment was savage, totally out of proportion to the alleged crime. The details varied from country to country. The overall pattern was uniform because it reflected not the local choice of a military commander or German administrator, but a policy commanded from the highest level in the German state. Already in 1941, Keitel, uh, Hitler's chief of staff, uh, issued the, <coughs> the infamous Nacht und Nebel, the night and fog order, uh, which decreed that in foreign courts, when anyone was accused of a, of a crime against the Reich, and that person was unlikely to have issued a death sentence against him or her. The SD would pick them up, spirit them away to Germany, and in Germany they would be made to disappear without trace. And um, thousands of people throughout Europe were made to disappear and still are without trace. Uh, Keitel explained that Hitler was not interested in anything but death penalty and doing it in this way the family, friends and acquaintances were left to worry and to wonder what happened and to wonder about their own prospects. Keitel also instructed Wehrmacht commanders on all fronts to ascribe any act of resistance to communists and uh, to execute batches of so-called communists for every German soldier killed. The recommended number was 50 to 100 for every German superman who bit the dust. The horrors taking place, the euthanasia program, the relentless pursuit of the Jews, and all these other excesses follow from the ideology that underlay Hitler's actions. Now what made Hitler's idea different uh, was not their racial overtones. All developed societies have racial biases and still do. The American treatment of the Indians in the 19th century in many cases were nothing but simple genocide. Even as late as World War II, let us not forget the conventional wisdom in the United States military was that the Japanese, for racial reasons, could never mount major military operations. They couldn't handle the logistics. And of course, they could not learn to fly planes properly because of their slanted eyes. This was actually serious American military doctrine when the war broke out. I need not tell you it changed quickly at Pearl Harbor. And uh, also in the subsequent battles when uh, the uh, Japanese got the better of us all the time in the air. Now, what made Hitler's, dear, Hitler's ideas different from those found in other societies was not their racial orientation. Uh, it was that the Nazis drafted researchers and scientists into proven, proving their racial theses, <clears throat> usually by standing science on, the, on its head in the process, and uh, secondly, they then proceeded forcibly to eliminate these so-called undesirable er elements, and they did so in the middle of the 20th century, when that kind of brutality had gone out of style among advanced nations. 
And let's not forget that Germany was the most educated Western advanced nation. So although tangible opposition in Denmark remained low, it still upset the German administrators seriously. One could sense their frustration at this surprisingly unforeseen problem that was hard to explain to superiors in Berlin. Whatever the Germans did to discourage resistance always had the opposite effect of that intended. The ultimate step in trying to deter resistance came with the first execution in August 1943. I well remember reading about it in a Danish newspaper, Politiken in Copenhagen, and uh, I couldn't believe it. I said, what? This guy, he hadn't done anything I haven't done. In fact, he hasn't done as much as I've done, and the bastards actually shot him. I decided right there and then to do what I could to avenge him. So there you see a perfectly normal person reading this reacts exactly the opposite way the Germans hoped and intended for us to react. To understand why that was so and uh, why the Germans were unsuccessful in using terror to direct people's actions. Um, I would like to remind you that not long ago, we sent, uh, last fall, late last summer, we sent cruise missiles to flatten some terrorist training camps in Afghanistan. And we also sent some tomahawks into the Sudan to take out a chemical factory suspected of making nerve gas and that sort of thing. Um, rather extreme measures, you'll have to agree. We've never done that sort of thing before. And after all, even the best organized terrorist groups, short of getting hold of an atomic bomb, the most they can possibly do to the United States is, relatively speaking, to administer pinpricks to the world's most powerful military power. Nevertheless, you didn't hear any outcry against it at the time in the public. Now, look at the situation in 1943. There, the perpetrators of the terror were the German police, backed by the SS, backed by the world's most powerful army at the time. The ones who did, who fought these terrorists, we were uh, raggedy-ass bunch of amateurs, every one of them, every one of us, trying to make up for, uh, by our wits for our lack of experience and knowledge in how to handle explosives, how to handle weapons. The conclusion from a comparison of these two completely, complete extremes on the scale uh, is, I believe, that in all civilized people, there is a natural revulsion to terrorism. It's something we simply will not tolerate and we react to it violently, totally regardless of the realistic possibility of really uh, bringing it down. So in trying to make the Danes and other Europeans fall into line by using terror, the Germans effectively shot themselves in the foot. By committing outrageous atrocities, by behaving like sadists and barbarians, they caused themselves to be seen as representing evil. And if resistance comes to be seen not as fighting against Germans, the fighting against the SS, or fighting against the Gestapo, but as fighting against evil itself, it changes its complexion. It takes on a, an aspect 
that you cannot measure by a simple cost-benefit calculation. It makes some individually, individuals gradually adopt the view that living as distinct from just surviving sometimes require, we, uh, acquires its value from taking risks and making sacrifices that make life itself richer and more worthwhile, though possibly cutting it short as well. The result was that when Hitler, in the fall of 1943, decided to go after Denmark's Jews, the Danes were at long last primed to put their collective foot down. Carl, do you think I could have some water? <clears throat> that would be great. When I grew up in Denmark in the 1920s uh, and 30s, anti-Semitism was not an active force. Uh, it existed in all Western countries, but in Denmark very weakly. On the whole, Jews were looked upon not as Jews, but as uh, good citizens of whom, of whom the country on the whole could be proud. Many had well-respected careers, not just Niels Bohr in atomic uh, physics, but also many in literature, in education, in the arts, in jurisprudence, and so forth. When I was 12, my father took us on a summer trip to the Harz Mountains in Germany. We drove down in Ford Model A, and uh, it was just at the time when Hitler was about to take power. And uh, Nazi stormtroopers were roaming the countryside in uh, open, uh, usually stake body trucks. And uh, when we came through, the, through these um, serene little villages in the Harz Mountains, at the entrance to each, to each village there would be um, a sign saying, Juden unerwünscht, Jews not wanted. And a little bit farther on, there would be a larger than life-size cutout of a uh, stormtrooper who would be sternly shooing away a little bearded figure with a sack on his back. That was the Nazi stereotype of the Jewish merchant. I remember my father's reaction um, and uh, it was typical of the reaction in Scandinavia at the time. Most Danes were actually bemused rather than upset by this pursuit of the Jews. They were wondering sort of vaguely about the phenomenon. Uh, could there actually be a vast Jewish, thank you, vast okay. Jewish conspiracy to foment war, to steal from honest, hardworking citizen, rape Christian maidens, just the way our forebears at Viking period had, had fun doing and so forth. Could there really be a vast international conspiracy of Jews? It was just not quite possible for us naive bumpkins touring along in our four day in the Harz Mountains to believe that a modern state and one as highly respected internationally as Germany could actually fabricate and disseminate out and out lies. It just didn't seem quite possible. However, in 1943, 11 years had passed and we could at that time very well imagine that Germany could do that sort of thing. Word about the impending action against the Jews had been leaked by a German official, actually two of them, with more conscience than Nazi loyalty. The Jews, by far most of them in Copenhagen, uh, hurriedly left their homes on just a couple of hours notice went into hiding with Gentile friends, neighbors, and so forth. The logical thing was to try to get them to free a neutral Sweden. A short boat trip 
from Copenhagen uh, if you can dodge the German patrols. Uh, the Swedes agreed to accept them. Before you start lauding the Swedes, let me remind you, it took some persuasion. And the Danes actually did a very good job of persuading the Swedes. Uh, well, I won't go into that. Uh, <clears throat> so to get them to Sweden, which was uh, once you could get them onto a fishing boat, a fairly simple matter, a network came into being almost overnight. And the interesting thing is that it wasn't we in the underground who did that. Yeah, we worked on it. But we were still only a few handfuls of saboteurs. We couldn't have begun to deal with a problem that size. That was done by quite ordinary people who would not have dreamed of doing sabotage, but who readily rose to the occasion to do what amounts to a humanitarian helping action. I, at that point, was working closely with a friend of mine, a uh, co-worker, another saboteur. His name was Thies, and uh, over a beer we discussed how can we get a piece of the action here. Uh, we decided that we'd collect Jews right downtown in front of National um, the inner part of Copenhagen, the old castle, is ringed by canals. They go back to the Middle Ages. They were a defensive uh, moat at that time. And uh, on the canals, there were canal boats that, during the war, supplemented the streetcar system. And uh, we put our hands on one of those boats, and we draft drafted a retired uh, harbor pilot into uh, skippering it and we picked little batches of Jews up in front of the Gestapo noses downtown and took them out into the fishing harbor, uh, which is somewhat remote from the center of the city. The Copenhagen Harbor complex is vast, and in the southern end was the fishing harbor. Uh, from there, they were transshipped to fishing boats and taken across to uh, Sweden. Uh, no big deal, and we thought actually very little of it at the time. We thought quite mistakenly that our uh, pursuit of or our efforts to do factory sabotage was much more important. We had no idea that had our Jews been caught, they were destined to be murdered in Germany. Uh, the operation, incidentally, of evacuating the Jews uh, uh, benefited from the fact that the herring runs at that time of year and normal fishing activity is greater during that particular period in October. Uh, besides that, uh, some of the German patrols had been bribed and uh, some of them had been put in dry dock for repairs and so forth. So there was a network of um, collaborating forces making the entire evacuation possible and it did come off with no losses. Um, so from a, a standing start of doing sabotage with nothing better than a few matches and fighting with nothing better than the occasional uh, pistol taken off some German officer, help finally came in 1943. At that time, the British Special Operations Executive, the SOE, together with the American SOE, the, uh, uh, I mean the, o the American OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, uh, started sending us arms and explosives. I was out to receive the first shipment that came to the island of Shellan. We received it out on Gutenberg's Hoy, uh, a hill some uh, 60 kilometers west of Copenhagen, and there was a little clearing in the forest. Uh, I'll never forget, it was a beautiful uh, August night, and we sat there waiting, and we couldn't quite believe that this was really going to happen. And then at the appointed hour, a uh, 
Lancaster bomber came in and uh, we had a couple of little flashlights standing in a line in the clearing. The clearing was about the size of a football field. And uh, as it went over, almost low enough to touch, uh, a series of parachutes blew, sprouted out of it. They looked black against the dark sky, but they were actually camouflage colors. And uh, they came down with containers. A container uh, was the word actually used by us at the time. We used that English word. And uh, uh, it's a cylindrical body, sort of like a torpedo, about yay big in diameter and about uh, eight feet long. Uh, when it lands with a thud, it can be disassembled with your hands, sort of like a soda bottle closer. Uh, each section then is about this size. It has a couple of carrying straps on it, and man can strap it on his back, and off you are. Uh, we took him to Copenhagen after having buried the parachutes, and unraveling, uh, uh, unpacking them, it, it was really it was beautiful. They had uh, explosives, real explosives. Plastique had just been invented. That's what all the terrorists use these days. Uh, it's sort of like children's modeling clay. Uh, very easy to use. Uh, it doesn't burn. Uh, you, can, uh, you can't set it off except with a real detonator and so forth. There was also another one called 808. Uh, it smelled a little bit. The plastique uh, doesn't smell at all. Uh, there were triggering devices, little gizmo you can strap to a, to a railroad rail, and when the wheel goes over it, it goes pow, and then the main explosive which you put on the rail blows. If you do it sensibly up where the uh, railroad line is elevated, uh, when the train comes off, it'll roll down and make a mess. And that's all. Lots of fun, and uh, we thoroughly enjoyed suddenly having our effectiveness go up by one or two orders of magnitude because we had the real material to work with. There were also Sten guns, uh, a submachine gun used extensively by the Allied forces. Uh, it looks very crude, it shoots very well, um, all kinds of other good things. Uh, So, from a standing start, uh, we suddenly could do things. But that was late in the game, people. That was after more than three and a half years of occupation. It did give a really psychological lift. The idea there, the enjoyment of seeing, feeling, smelling the weapons and explosives, come down to us from the sky, but packed by unseen hands, someplace in the British Isles, by people who were our com comrade in arms, comrades in arms, but people we would never see and never know. That was a psychologic lift. And then, and then I was, uh, there was Churchill's oratory, magnificent, his V for victory sign, which was tapped out in Morse code at the beginning and end of each broadcast, each newscast from BBC in London, and repeated in musical form in Beethoven's Fifth Symphony theme. These things were all whispers of freedom and just what was needed to keep going. So resistance became a fact of life in all of the five occupied countries. And for those of us who went underground and devoted ourselves to it, a pretty important fact of life. But unfortunately, resistance was not the dominant fact of the occupation that it was later made out to be. In May of 1944, I was caught, stupidly, in a Gestapo ambush, and I was slated for execution rather expeditiously. So I was removed from the resistance movement during the last 11 months of the occupation years. So I can't speak uh, from first knowledge of that particular 11 months period. And during that period, when it was obvious to
show everybody that Germany was losing the war, uh, the resistance grew explosively. I can, however, speak with some authority about the first four years, and that was when the fate of the Western world hung in the balance. As late as the spring of 44, we were still a pitifully small number who played cat and mouse with the Gestapo. By that same time, in the spring of 1944, 8,000 Danes had volunteered for the Waffen SS, all of whom risked their lives. 3,000 more had volunteered for German police troops in Denmark. Half of them lost their lives in Ru on the Russian front, incidentally. Uh, by that same time, uh, Danish firms in all fields had for four years been working for the Germans, repairing military equipment, constructing fortifications for the Germans, building airfields for German bombers to attack England, sending Danish workers to Germany to liberate German workers for the front. By that same time and for the rest of the war, Danish agriculture produced and exported food to Germany, good Danish farm produce fed 8.2 million Germans, a very critical contribution to Hitler's war economy. The truth is that collaboration, not resistance, was a dominant condition of the occupation years in Denmark, just as in the other four occupied countries. This was awkward when the war ended in 1945, because as Germany went down to total defeat, the occupied, now liberated countries would like to avoid sharing Germany's fate. Instead, they'd like to join the Allied camps, the honorable company of the victors, always desirable. In the face of the awkward, awkward reality, Danish diplomats strove to establish Denmark as loyal to the Allied cause and actually succeeded in gaining Denmark an invitation to the San Francisco Conference, founding the United Nations, uh, of which Denmark became the 50th member. It was done by the diplomatic corps abroad, by, here you have this enormous bundle of collaboration, here you have a little bundle of resistance. That you ignore. Instead, you focus on the little bundle of resistance, you magnify it, you talk about it, and you don't talk about that. The Allies, of course, knew perfectly well what the situation had been in the occupied countries. For reasons of their own, largely political, uh, they chose to accept the myth. The myth was this. Denmark was a small, stalwart country that had stood up to the Germans from the 9th of April 1940, in different ways to be sure, but they had all been in there pitching and standing up to the Germans. That picture was then propagated abroad and uh, what took place in the last 11 months in the last year, let us say, of the five years of occupation. The intense activity, underground work, organizing a Danish brigade in Sweden, which incidentally never fired a shot, uh, organizing a Danish underground or army, which fired even less of a shot, and so forth. All of that in the last year was sort of projected back in time four years when there was nothing but lethargy around, so that the official picture is small, stalwart country standing up to the Nazi colossus for five years regardless. I was pretty disgusted, so was Thies, when we came back and, uh, and became aware of this. But I've got better things to do than worry about how Denmark deals with its past. I immigrated in 1947. I uh, decided to forget about the whole thing, and which I did for 40 odd years.
Then three things decided me a few years ago to write a book about it. The first one was that, well, this is a small segment of Danish history. And uh, it's an important segment of Danish history. It's referred to in Denmark as Defem Ono Or. They were not evil years. They were very good years. Good years for the country, good years for the nation, and so forth. And I knew something about that, so I decided I'll put in my five cents worth. That was one reason. The other reason I decided to write a book was this. Denmark, when I grew up in the country in the 1920s and 30s, was an unbelievably beautiful country. It was peaceful, it was civilized to a degree that is hard to comprehend today. I remember taking my first gun off a German lying at my feet, and I had never held a live firearm in my hand before. And I was astounded. It was a piddling little 25 caliber automatic pistol. I was astounded how heavy it was. I couldn't believe a real firearm was that heavy. I had never touched a firearm. That is how pacific Denmark was in the interwar years, in the 20s and 30s. Now, when I go back to Denmark and I talk with somebody under 65 years of age, they have no idea what I'm talking about. That period, that country, Denmark in the 1920s and 30s, is as gone with the wind as Margaret Mitchell's antebellum south. It doesn't exist anymore, and you can't bring it back. So I decided, well, I can at least describe it to my sons. And this I tried to do in the book. The third reason I decided to write a book was that my students today at the Evergreen College in Olympia where I teach can't, absolutely cannot imagine what it was like to be in a live functioning underground. Sex and violence coexist in an odd, almost symbiotic state in a live underground. It's nothing like students imagine. So I did write it so it would be suitable for a college text. And uh, today, at least some students know what it was like in the Danish underground, because it is being used. When the book was published that last year, I, did, uh, I expected in Denmark there would be criticism in fact, outrage, because I do take issue with the myth. Um, to my surprise, the opposite happened. It was reviewed in just about uh, every Danish newspaper. And it was, without exception, reviewed lavishly. They called it cultural contribution to Danish history and all kinds of nice things. That I couldn't understand, because it ran totally contrary to what you see in the Freedom Museum in Copenhagen and in all these places where you can encounter the magnificent deeds that were performed during the occupation. Uh, then a couple of weeks after the publication, I got a letter from the um, vice president of the European Parliament in Brussels. Out of an empty air, it landed on my desk in Olympia. And he said first uh, some nice words about the book. That's, of course, you always like to read that. Uh, but more important, he said, the book is published at just the right time when the Danes are reviewing and updating their history of the occupation years in World War II. And lo and behold, I was back uh, giving a talk to a uh, NATO auxiliary uh, last uh, year in July, and I did find that indeed there was a vigorous public debate going on in Denmark about what happened in World War II. You would be interested to know that historians, of course, have for years been aware of what really happened. 
But it's very difficult for historians to set things straight because the population doesn't want to give to let go of the myth. The myth is good, you know. Resistance is is glamorous, uh, valor, and what have you. Who wants to talk about who wants to talk about collaboration and that sort of thing? Which, of course, is most of what went on. So you have the odd situation in Denmark and in all the other former occupied countries: Norway, Denmark, Holland, Belgium, and France. You have the situation that historians are putting down what really happens in the Western world, in, in Western culture. Historians do have the last word regardless whether the government likes it or not. So the historians are putting it down and people are really unhappy about it. Then I began to see other things that you've seen too and you may not have thought much of. Two years ago, the French Prime Minister Josquin articulated for the first time a public international apology about what the Vichy government had done during the war. Namely, it had uh, collaborated with the Germans in finding, arresting, and deporting Jews and sending them to their deaths in Germany. For the first time, France apologized. President Mitterrand, who died just before, had sat on that apology for seven years without releasing it because his own, he didn't want more discussion of his own doings during the war when he did work a dual situation. He worked partly for the uh, underground, he said, and partly for the Vichy government. And last year, you all, saw, you all saw how the Swiss, to be sure, under international pressure, particularly American pressure, are beginning to hand back some of their ill-gotten gain from fencing Jewish property during the war for the Nazis. Then, as I said, the Danish situation is going on. And you saw rather recently that we had a skeleton or two in the class of two here in the United States. And finally, Congress came around to apologizing and voting a small restitution to the Japanese who were so shamefully interned during the war, during World War II. So you might say, well, why now? Why are all these things beginning to happen now? And there are things like that booing also in Belgium and Holland. I'll tell you why. Because after 50 years, there are a few foot soldiers like yours truly still around. Not many of us. We're dying off very rapidly. Every year there are a lot fewer. But still, there are a few of us around. But we don't matter. All of the ones who were at the time in policy-making positions in uh, government or in the military, they were people 40 years old and up at the time. 50 years later, they're all dead. And if they're not dead, believe me, they're not going to scream. <laughs> That's why today these things are being dealt with, unraveled, updated. I think it's an interesting picture. I think it's going to be very interesting for all of us to see in the next probably the next very few years whether other countries are the Swedes going to come around to talk a little bit more about all the immense help they gave Hitler in a thousand ways during World War II. Are the Norwegians going to talk a little bit about why they lost half their Jews? Uh, uh, some of these things, uh, uh, it's a little soul searching going to be done. I think it will and it'll be interesting for us to see. If there are any questions, uh, I'll be happy to. Yes, if I can ask. I have a question. Number one, did we have a National Socialist Party in Denmark? Yes. Uh, there was a National Socialist Party. It had um, three members in the, uh, three representatives, I mean, in uh, uh, Polgatinger. Yeah. Did you tell by 
the last name of a person that is a Jew in Denmark? The, by the last name? Yes. Uh, yeah, pretty much. As you can do in so many cases, you can you can uh, guess. You aren't always right, of course, but you can guess uh, somebody's ethnic background from their names. Yeah, that before I can mention picked up Jewish people in the body on the street, so to speak. Did you identify them because they wore some tag that had uh, described as Jewish, or how did you know the ones you were picking up oh. and putting on the fishing boat were? Uh, uh, nice question, yeah. Uh, how do you know uh, where they're sitting hiding around in, in various places in Copenhagen, these uh, thousands of people? Uh, that's where the network that came into being almost overnight um, was very handy. Um, to give a different example, um, I was asked at, a, uh, at about the same time, I began to give instruction in explosives and firearms, because by that time, uh, this was something I knew about. I had by that time gotten military training and whatnot. Uh, where did these invitations come from? I don't know. That you sort of came out of nowhere. Could you uh, go to such and such a meeting hall tonight at 8 and do such and such? And you would just by guessing by God say, this one is bona fide, is reliable. Somebody you've never seen before. And uh, he's not an informer, he's not an agent, and so forth. The same thing with the Jews. Um, in, in that kind of situation, an occupation situation, where you're really under uh, secret police surveillance, somehow uh, word filters in, around in the community. Not to the extent that news really becomes known. We had no idea what really went on at the, uh, at the war fronts in the various places, very little. But specific news, somebody was killed there yesterday, although that became so common that it wasn't worth passing on. But what you're saying there, you know, there are six Jews such and such who would like to go. Okay, tell them to go to this boat stop tomorrow afternoon between 4 and 4.30, not to bring any suitcases to carry, to wear gloves, not uncommon at that time, even, uh, you know, nowadays you, nobody wears gloves uh, except maybe in the winter, but at that time, not unusual, leather gloves. Wear gloves, carry a newspaper in your right hand whatever little thing we told them to do. Uh, and that was it. You don't want to know who the people, who the person is who tells you. He doesn't really want to know who knows how he got your name and so forth. It's a very difficult situation to explain. But when uh, resistance began to spread, how does it spread? Um, well, somebody hears something or senses something going on. If he or she does nothing, then he or she is already complicit with what goes on if you haven't reported it. From being, from being complicit to taking action, there is a very short step and you sort of slide into it. Uh, could I sleep in your basement tonight? Uh, it would be handy. Yeah, okay. Now you're already doing what the police wouldn't want you, secret police wouldn't want you to do, and so forth. So you kind of slide into it. And that's what took place late in the game, in 1944. And uh, it, it is a very odd, it's a very difficult situation to explain. And one of the things, we had a discussion of that um, just this past weekend. I presented a paper up at the uh, at University of Washington to the Scandinavian Studies Association. And uh, the, the historians 
misrepresent the occupation life itself without any, any bad intent. And it's something that can't be avoided in this sense, that the situation was so unbelievably chaotic. Society was chaotic at that time. People did, some people obeyed the law, others did not and so forth, but it was chaotic. If you describe a chaotic situation calmly and uh, truthfully and so forth, the very, the very act of describing it imposes an order on it. It is no longer chaotic. The sequence in which you name things is in itself an order. You can't really describe chaos except just by saying it's chaos. If you start going into it, so in that sense, uh, it, it, is, it, it is rather unique, uh, resistance itself. I'm sorry it takes such a long answer. Yes? Have there ever been any attempts at reunions? Have there ever been what? Attempts at reunions or getting groups together to... Uh, I, uh, three, three years ago, honey, or four years ago, we went to uh, Washington, D.C., and uh, there were a hundred and... 100, 110 uh, uh, old uh, uh, resistance people from Denmark who came over to set a stone, uh, a memorial stone at Arlington Cemetery for the, for the American airmen who lost their lives over Denmark, dropping us explosives and arms. Uh, Prince uh, Joachim came with them and uh, uh, 10 or 12 uh, of the Royal Guard with the bearskin caps and the whole thing. Uh, it's quite nice, yeah. No, I haven't actually. Uh, the ones, unfortunately, that I worked with were mostly killed. And um, the few, well, there are still two or three uh, alive in Denmark. And we see each other, but years between. You said you yes. Well, my, my timing was perfect, not due to any brilliance on my part, but uh, it was on the I was caught on the 26th of May, 1944, and uh, just as they were ready to uh, put me away for good, and uh, I was waiting to be executed, the Volkestreichen, the uh, uh, general strike in Copenhagen, the people's strike, broke out on the 1st of July, 1944. And uh, it, was, it was very um, unpleasant for the Germans because they depended on these huge uh, export shipments of food to Germany. And uh, in July, you leave a train, remember I'm talking about pre-refrigeration uh, shipments of agricultural products, of, butter and pork and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, you let a train, a freight train, stand on a siding for another three or four days and uh, it's all spoiled and they can have it as far as that goes. So the Germans were very concerned and they made an, a sub rosa, an unofficial agreement with the underground. No more executions if you call off the strike. And the uh, the strike was called off, and uh, the food started rolling, and they, of course, didn't keep their word very long. They kept their word something like two and a half months. Then they started uh, what they call shooting during attempt to escape, and, uh, which is just another label for <coughs> executing somebody. Uh, but in that short period, uh, Tees and I uh, were both exported first to a Danish concentration camp, Freusliu, and then uh, from there on to Germany. And uh, we escaped later on joint patents forces and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, you, in your book you describe uh, that after the war, you spent quite some time in the American zone with the Americans um, rounding up war criminals. And you haven't mentioned anything about that. I'm very interested in that transition and, and what you did and how that operated, because that was one time. Uh, 
well, <coughs> when uh, uh, Thies and I ended up in a concentration camp called Wandsleben am See, it's way over near Halle in the eastern part of Germany, and we worked in a mine half a mile underground, real bomb proof, and uh, it was where the Germans at that time had stuck all of their aircraft manufacturing, usually deep mine shafts, and uh, there was a big operation going on down there. It saved our lives in the sense that usually in the camps you died from exposure. Um, starvation, yes, but you see as your body sort of breaks down, you lose resistance because uh, of the low calorie intake. Usually what kills you is pneumonia or dysentery or that sort of thing, but mostly exposure. Working outdoors in a lot less clothes than I'm wearing right here, in sleet in the middle of the winter and that sort of thing. Uh, but working in the mine, uh, we benefited from geothermal heat, the heat that comes from the core of the earth, radioactive decay. And in the mine at that level, it's the same temperature, summer and winter, and it's about 22 degrees centigrade, which is a perfect, pleasant summer temperature. And that actually s saved us, undoubtedly, because most of the others died uh, at, at the surface of the ground. Then uh, uh, we, uh, we escaped from there later when we were evacuated. Um, one of the things that, uh, I just showed my class the other day a film that some of you may have seen. Uh, Diane, my wife, uh, uh, took it, uh, taped it off PBS, and it's called The Camps, and uh, it is from concentration camps. British uh, military footage that has never been shown before. I had never seen it either, and, but that was really what the camps were like. You see them stacked, the dead bodies and all that sort of thing. And uh, um, it, one of the things you see is how the Germans, to the very end, trying to, tried to kill off as many as possible, particularly in the camps. Um, and they, had, they wanted to do the same with us, but they didn't have enough ammunition to, to shoot us in, in the last camp. Um, it, it takes quite a bit, you know, you can't go and, you know, bang, bang, one bullet apiece, that doesn't work. Uh, so you need a lot of ammunition if you want to try that. Instead, they, uh, they, the SS guarding the camp took the elevator cables out and were going to drop us down into the elevator shaft. You fall half a mile, you're dead. Uh, so that was incidentally typical. That was what the kind of ingenious thing the SS thinks of. Um, they were talked out of it by uh, what is called a Lager Älteste. That is the, the oldest uh, appointed uh, inmate of the camp. This Lager Älteste was a form of mayor, a uh, socialist mayor uh, from a little German town, but he was a very, he was a very strong personality, imposing figure. He was about six foot four, and he went to the commandant of the camp and he said, you do that, you drop us in the, in, in, in the mine shaft, you're all going to be killed by the Americans when they come, and they built this up, and it gave them second thoughts. So they evacuated us, and during the evacuation, Thies and I uh, escaped. Then, uh, when we joined the American forces, I worked for military government. Uh, the MG on my helmet here is actually from that period, uh, military government, American military government, and our job was to catch Nazis, and we had a great time. Uh, <laughs> that was very easy. That's the easiest job I've ever held. You'd be amazed how easy it was to catch Nazis. Uh, I described that in the, book <laughs> in, in the book fairly well, I think. Are you, do you agree uh, that you understood what went I on there? I understood what you said, but I'm not quite sure. Uh, you, you, didn't, you really didn't go into it. Uh, you, you described that you did do it, and you did you have a couple of incidents. But how did you, um, they, you were actually working for the Americans in uniform. They actually right. put you we were in American uniforms. 
we went and we combed out the Nazis. They were mostly, they were almost all in the countryside because the cities had been so devastated that they were evacuated. There were very few Germans living in cities at that time. They were out in the countryside. Every farm, small, medium, or big, and in the area where we were, there were huge farms over there in, in Saxon, in Saxo Saxonia. Uh, they would have farms with 150 people living there, uh, you know, just evacuated from the cities. And uh, this is where we, we found the Nazis, and uh, they were easy to find. Uh, give each other away. Well, you, you know, at the entrance to the village, you say, hey, you, come here. And uh, put him in the back of the jeep, and we will say to him, now, you're in trouble. You were the Ortsbauernführer in this village. Ortsbauernführer was a no local Nazi uh, uh, agricultural leader. Uh, each little village had that, you know, in a totally Nazified country. Uh, and we're taking you in now because uh, your game is up. Oh, no, no, I wasn't, no, it was Heinz Kübel. He lives over there behind the church. Oh yeah, well we'll see. So we go over and pick up Heinz Kripo over there. And uh, he said, yeah, true, I was the Ortsbauern, but uh, I wasn't really the one who did blah, 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 blah. He would just spill the beans about what had been going on there and it was really the people living over there. You would unravel a village in just about as little time as it takes me to tell you. Uh, these strutting supermen overnight became abject, really pathetic figures in most cases. So it, it wasn't hard. We brought them in by the hundreds and uh, stuck them in jail, wrote up reports on them. And uh, the, there was a little shooting, but very little. Uh, I, I think I describe a case or two in my book. Uh, we simply went to a military government in Eisleben. Eisleben is, uh, you might know, the, uh, the town where Luther was born. Uh, I used to be a Lutheran, but when I, when I read up on what Lutherans really are, I gave it up. Anyway, uh, in, uh, in Eisleben, uh, the Americans had just uh, arrived and uh, they had difficulties. The American military government was extremely well organized from the states. They arrived knowing as much as could be known about a given little town or village. The one thing they were short of was uh, people who spoke German. And we did that. So we were immediately hired and uh, we metamorphosed into American soldiers in a matter of an hour and, and had a good time. Yes. When you were in the underground, were you scrutinized to the extent that you have to appear to have some other main activity in your life? Oh, you mean what did I do besides? Um, I, I was I was at the time an engineering student, although in the spring of '44 I couldn't stay home anymore. Uh, I I had to go really underground. Uh, my uh, buddy Tees had already been really underground for several months at that time. Uh, you sort of have to judge uh, how close are they to you. Uh, you. You know they're looking for you, but they don't know your identity. And you know, one Dane looks exactly like another. That's what my wife always tells me. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Which is true. <laughs> you know. So they don't know your identity. And uh, when I was arrested, they didn't know my identity. They only knew my cover name. And uh, so uh, it's, a, it, it's, it's not a problem. Uh, you go underground when you think they're too close for comfort. And some people can't take that too well. Some people uh, get very nervous when, when Gestapo is after them and they know it. And uh, those we mostly just had to ship to Sweden because if somebody is, if somebody has a nervous breakdown, he or she is a danger and you want to get rid of them. 
Sweden was wonderful to have uh, because it was a haven and uh, it was possible to send them there, they're safe. At the same time, however, they were cut off from any more activity and uh, some of us didn't think that was a nice idea. Yeah. Get me out of here, I'll, I'll leave. 